Well, we've got a special treat uh, today in our keynote speaker, uh, Secretary John Laird, the, sec the California Secretary for Natural Resources. And I, I know many of you know him uh, because he's an icon in this area and uh, has had so many different jobs in our region that he could probably tell us all how to solve all these problems pretty quickly. <laughs> um, John has spent over 35 years in public service, uh, graduating from UC Santa Cruz in 1972, and was elected to the Santa Cruz City Council in 1981. That's 35 years ago. <laughs> um, and during that time, he also served as the mayor twice. And. Uh, did everything, as, as you know, for the many city council people that are here. You work on local transit and transportation and water agencies and inter-regional government agencies. So during that time, he did that all. And uh, in 2002, was elected to the state assembly, was uh, re-elected twice by very large majorities. And what impressed me most about his tenure in the state assembly uh, six years because there were term limits at that time, or there still are, but they're longer, um, was that he had 82 bills that he sponsored and were passed into law. I remember hearing about some congressman, I won't mention who, uh, in a, not in our region, but another region, who had been in Congress for like 20 years and he had one bill. So, um, way to go, John. Um, and I think all of this experience was why uh, Governor Jerry Brown tapped John uh, to be the Secretary for Natural Resources in January of 2011. I also would be remiss if uh, I didn't mention in this year when uh, we're all trying to figure out where our country is going, that uh, John has been a longtime Chicago Cubs fan. And so, it just goes to show that if you keep working and you keep at it, especially if we keep at it on a local and regional level, good things will eventually happen. So with that, please join me in giving John Laird a warm welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, that was a sweet introduction. And I should say that at the end of my biography, it always says I'm a lifelong Chicago Cubs fan. And for, I hate to say it, it's now probably over 40 years. Uh, somebody shouted and correct, corrected the number of years I'd had in public service at a recent speaking engagement, so I have to update that biography. Uh, that it would be said that I was a lifelong Chicago Cubs fan and the whole crowd would laugh and snicker. And, uh, <clears throat> and I even had an experience where the, uh, the Angels manager came to the floor of the assembly after they'd won uh, the World Series, and the speaker told me to stow my Cubs hat in my desk and to pull it on when he was speaking. A and he said they'd had to beat another California team to get there, and he knew there were mixed loyalties but he sees this guy across the room with the Chicago Cubs hat, and he said, how did you get elected to anything? <laughs> so, uh, so I was telling Jeff Dunn a few minutes ago that two weeks ago, I went to my father's grave, I put the Cubs pennant, I put the Giants headline, or the headline on the Chronicle that said, hell freezes over. <laughs> I put it on his grave. I feel like we closed the loop, and now nobody will laugh when that happens as an introduction. So it is a wonderful thing. <clears throat> and I'm thrilled to be home. I still live here weekends. And anytime, as I was telling Mary Lou Geike, anytime I get an invitation on Thursday, I'm thrilled. It gets me out of Sacramento early and back to the Monterey Bay. So I look for those on Thursday or Friday. Uh, but I know that. Uh, MBAP had really wanted the governor to come and keynote today, and he couldn't work it out, and he sends his greetings. But just a couple, this morning, he, uh, 
he announced who he was appointing to attorney general to succeed Kamala Harris. Uh, Javier Becerra, who's a congressman from Los Angeles, will be the next attorney general. But last night, and it's just worth a mention, um, he inducted the annual Hall of Fame class into the California Hall of Fame. Eight people go in a year. This was the 10th anniversary. And it was really interesting. You get a flavor for what California is like. Last night's class that was inducted included Isabel Allende, uh, Bill Perry, the former defense secretary, Tony Gwynn uh, from the San Diego Padres, um, the founder of Tower Records, and uh, George Takei and Harrison Ford. And uh, among others, and, and there was this interesting byplay where they said that, uh, actually I think George Takei was the only one of the inductees that was a native Californian. Everybody else was an immigrant. And, and Governor Brown went out of his way to say, in the last 60 years, the only governors of California uh, that are native Californians have had the last name of Brown. Everybody else is uh, uh, an immigrant that is governor. And Harrison Ford told the story that he was failing philosophy and failing English, and so he took an acting class in Wisconsin to try to lift his GPA. That got him into acting. He thought the only places there were to get a job were either on the Far East Coast or on the Far West Coast. And so he and his wife packed up their Volkswagen Beetle with everything they owned, and they flipped a coin. And whatever the coin toss result was would determine which coast they went to. And so they flipped the coin, and after the coin toss, it came up New York. And so he turned to his wife and said, how about two out of three? <laughs> and so he ended up in California and is now in the California Hall of Fame. And every single person that spoke said they consider themselves a California and that it is really a place where people go with their dreams and come from all over and are very productive and successful. And I think that's the perfect foundation for, for talking to you today because I, I gather from some of the Snickers there are a few immigrants here in the room as well. And, uh, and particularly in the Monterey Bay, uh, people come and seek their fortune and love where it is and try to make it special and put extra energy. And I want to congratulate the Alf family. And when uh, George Sr.'s father was still alive, I heard numerous times how he came to America. And, and the one funny thing is, is I could never tell with how much money, because sometimes it was 50 cents, sometimes it was a dollar, sometimes it was three dollars. But he came to America with almost no money. And what you saw earlier in the award is how people made their way very successfully because of the opportunity that was given to them uh, uh, when they immigrated. And so I, too, have been assigned the topic today about well-being. And yes, I know that when you're MBEP and you're looking at everything, uh, well-being comes from good health care and good transportation and schools and a trained workforce and adequate housing and affordable housing and many things you'll be talking about. But I really wanted to look at what my portfolio is right now on resources and the natural environment and link it to the economy and link it to the Monterey Bay because what we're doing statewide is really replicated here in many ways and all the issues are at hand in the same ways. And if you just stand back and you look at California, and I have this charge right now of all of California, which is sometimes daunting and uh, overwhelming, but if you just look at California as it was in its natural state at the time of statehood, uh, we have 10% of the amount of wetlands we had in California at the time of statehood, 90% less. When the state was admitted, the delta, which is the water hub for California, where the San Joaquin and Sacramento rivers come together and flow to the bay, had over 500,000 acres of wetlands. It has 30,000 acres now. 
uh, most of the major rivers in California were undammed, and that's where the settlements were. And as you heard in the previous segment in talking about rivers, uh, the settlements were done in a way that communities didn't look to rivers as opportunity. They looked at things to be levied or protected or not as integrated with the life in the community. And they were also, in many places in California, looked at places to be dammed for the water system, which, you know, we are working to re with the federal government to restore the San Joaquin River, which literally has not had a run past uh, a place in Madera County of any significance for 60 years. It is just sand past what is known as gravelly uh, ford there. We used to have incredibly abundant fish species off the coast to uh, witness a cannery row and what it meant here. And we have had various challenges and crashing fish species, which is, you know, affected both recreational, affected commercial, and it just affected the ecosystem for for what survives here. We've taken more groundwater out of groundwater in California than it, it should have ever been done and is humanly possible. And when you look at the maps from NASA, from the start of the drought to the end of the drought, the overdrafting in certain uh, aquifers in California was off the charts. It was significant, completely uh, unsustainable. And an amazing amount of California used to be river bottom or lake bottom or amazing geological formations. It's the best farmland in the United States and we are losing farmland at the rate of tens of thousands of acres, hundreds of thousands every decade, and that presents a challenge with how much agriculture is a key part of the economy uh, in California. We have uh, the Salton Sea, which unfortunately is in my purview, and uh, the, the fresh water that's guaranteed to go into it expires next year and is expected to recede uh, uh, dramatically over the next decades. And then we have the overlapping impacts from a changing climate. And I know there are people that wish to argue about whether the climate is changing. Um, and yet, uh, right now, we just modified the number. We have over 100 million dead trees inside the borders of the state of California. And uh, my predecessor, Mike Chrisman, who was Resources Secretary uh, under Arnold Schwarzenegger, is a farmer in Tulare County. And he came by recently, and he, his farm is sort of in eastern Tulare County. It's on about 300 feet elevation. And he looks up to the southern Sierra and he says, there's just one particular strip at a certain elevation that's just completely brown. Almost every tree at that elevation has died. And so we are facing an amazing challenge with our forests. We have an ocean that is acidifying at an alarming rate. Uh, it, it, Puget Sound is sort of uh, ground zero and really what is exemplifying it and is is speaking it out to people because the shellfish industry there suddenly started to crash and it was the pH level of just the water in the natural bay that they were using to, uh, uh, to fish. Our state and federal water system together we deliver five million acre feet a year in a normal year which we haven't had many of lately and that is to 25 million Californians and to 3 million acres of irrigated agriculture. And it depends on Sierra snowpack. The snowpack is our water bank. And uh, there was a time the year before last when the snowpack in the Sierra in the middle of summer was 0% of normal, 0% of normal, 25% below the lowest recorded on record uh, for that time in the summer. And that's what we depend on uh, for our state and agricultural uh, water source. And, which is of a particular interest here, we have a rising sea level. Uh, the, and the interesting thing is, is I uh, chair the Ocean Protection Council, and I run the risk with Gary Griggs sitting here of being corrected from the audience at any uh, uh, given moment. Uh, but, <clears throat> Uh, uh, we, in 2011, 
uh, issued a report on the science for sea level rise in California. Scientists looked and they said the median at that time, the median in 2050 would be 14 inches and the median in 2100 would be five feet. And by median, it's like if we are really successful across the world in lowering greenhouse gas emissions, could be lower than that. If we're an abject failure, could be higher than that. And it's really changed in that five years. We just commissioned an update to that study. It's changed because there's faster ice melts in certain parts of the world, and yet there are different ways to, to compute that that make it appear to go up and down a little. But I said to the scientists in, in March of 2011, you know, we're acting as if it's just starting from this point. If we were to look back 100 years, what would it be? And they said, well, it's been roughly seven inches of sea level rise in 100 years. So really, while people want to argue, we're in the continuum, it's just accelerating. Uh, the amount uh, uh, at, the, uh, at the benchmarks going forward. And so, and as I'm fond of saying too, sea level rise isn't just like water slowly going up in a bathtub. It's the extreme event. It's the two-year-old cannonballing into the bathtub. And we know that here on the Central Coast because it was, it was actually a very interesting story because the day we did the sea level rise science in Sacramento, where I gaveled that meeting to order at 9 a.m., at 8 a.m., the Japanese tsunami hit California's coast. And the two major places that sustained damage were Crescent City and Santa Cruz. And they did it at low tide before sea level rise had appreciated more. So that is another challenge that we have uh, uh, that is out there. And if I can use just one more example, uh, I have the charge of working on issues having to do with Lake Tahoe. And when I first got there and the governor first got there, Nevada wanted to pull out of the Tahoe Compact. And I spent a year in marathon negotiations sessions and we saved the compact, have a new general plan, but we created a science committee and it's a joint Nevada, California one. I chair it with my counterpart in Nevada. And so we were having this meeting, it's when the president and the governors came to Tahoe in early September. And the scientists just colloquially said, traditionally, uh, Lake Tahoe is filled from melted snowpack. And because it's so cold when it hits the lake, it just goes right to the bottom and it provides a circulation to the lake that doesn't otherwise exist. And in the last five years, we've had some years where not much comes in, but whatever does come in is warm at the upper levels of the lake. And so Lake Tahoe right now is warming faster than almost any freshwater lake in the world. And what is our measurement for health? Our measurement for health is how clear the lake is. And ironically, because there's less sediment coming in, because stuff isn't coming in, the clarity's getting better. So by our measurement, the health of the lake is improving while it's warming faster than almost any freshwater lake, which means that we have to change what our measures of health are. And we're still stuck a little bit on what we can do on that one, although it's dealing with invasives and other things. And when somebody out there is beginning to wonder, how does this connect to the economy? And, um, and if you look at Tahoe, Tahoe's history was that gaming was the economy. And because there's Indian casinos in California and gaming in all these places that it didn't exist before, that is really fading in Lake Tahoe. And they are substituting environmental and recreational tourism as the economic anchor of Tahoe, which means the health of the lake is central to what they think their economic future is. And, and additionally, just as a digression, but something to put on MBEP's minds, they get highway money based on the people that live there, not the people that come there on the weekend. 
and so they never quite get enough money to handle what their tourism traffic is. And there seems to be three places in California where that's true, uh, Mammoth, Tahoe, and the Monterey Bay. And so over time, the federal government just did a slight tweak where you get some extra credit in transportation money based on uh, who actually really comes. And that's something we're going to have to think about, I think, here over time and work with our legislators, even though, of course, that's outside of my uh, ballywick, and I'm not sure I'm formally endorsing it. Um, <laughs> but, but that is something that I think this group is going to have to think about to, and work with. So then you lay out all these problems, which seem daunting, and it's like, what do you practically do? And when it comes to fishing, we now have the largest network of marine protected areas uh, off of any of the 48 states. It's based on science. Uh, we are doing our best to try to have sustainable fisheries established over time off the coast here. It has been bumpy. Certain fishing interests have been grumpy, but um, <clears throat> we are really trying to, I think everybody accepts giving some of the crashes, that that's what we have to do. So it's based on science, it's based on enforcement, it's based on education of the public. It's something that people could work on here. <coughs> and, uh, and when we do that, uh, I think we'll bring it back. And, and the one thing that I am, am fond of saying is that, um, you know, this was the first one off the Central Coast, and we are nearing nine or ten years since it was first done, and there was a conference at five years. And when that conference happened, the first science showed that the indicators were good. And I think people ask me, has it come back? And it's like, that's not the right question, because if you, uh, I am a lay person, uh, if you are a marine biologist, you know that certain species, some of the rockfish, are very fertile, it's opposite of humans. They're most fertile at the end of their life, and some of them are 25 or 30 years when it gets there. And we've been doing these for eight or 10 years. So we're where we're supposed to be, but we don't know until you get to that life cycle uh, whether it works. Uh, another thing is water and water supply, given what I said. And that is really central economically to everything uh, uh, that people in this room are doing. And Santa Cruz and Monterey are unique. Um, they do not import water. Water does not come from some big federal or state project, have to be self-sufficient, have to rely locally. And I used to, when I was a legislator, I tell this story, I used to uh, say, I'm really resentful that the general fund has to pay for somebody else's water. and. Uh, and the taxpayers here that don't benefit because they don't get imported water have to close a school or cut a health care program to pay for somebody else's water when we pay 100% for our own on the Central Coast. And, of course, now as Resources Secretary, I support that. Uh, um, <laughs> and yet, uh, when we did a water action plan for the state, uh, the Secretary of EPA, the Secretary of Ag, and myself, uh, almost three years ago, did a plan for what we had to do for a sustainable water supply in California. You can log on to our webpage. It's only 20 pages. It's understandable. And it really says we have to have conservation as a way of life. We have to have more storage, water recycling, manage our groundwater basins sustainably. Uh, yes, some things such as desal, if they work, uh, should be in the mix. And then when the water bond was negotiated, that passed in 2014, and some of my staff members were instrumental in all the negotiations, it is tied to that water action plan. So it's not a list of geographic carve-outs. It's a list of if you can produce recycling, you could get funded. If you could produce storage, you'd get funded. So based on regulations and merit and those goals, that's how we guided that water. And I know there are people probably in this room that are working on applications trying to do that because that's where the equality ended up coming. Everybody could do it. That isn't necessarily if you're just on state or federal water. 
Additionally, uh, right at that time the water bond passed, uh, the state passed the Groundwater Management Act because we were uh, the last state in the West not to in any way regulate groundwater. And as I said in many speeches at the time, when Texas is ahead of us on an environmental issue, we should stretch our head. And, <clears throat> and so we have until 2040 to bring the most stressed groundwater basins in California into balance, where you only uh, take out every year what goes in. And we have to, that gives us uh, almost a quarter century to adjust ourselves to what that means in yield and to restore some of the basins that are woefully overdrafted. So we really have that going forward. And right here on the Central Coast with the Pajaro Valley Management Agency is a case of a place that got there 20 years before the state did. And they had lots of bumps in Pajaro, lawsuits, people protesting. But in the end, they have gotten to the point uh, that they're doing what they have to do and are marching down the road to sustainability in a way that the other places uh, in the state will have to do it. And, and you know, I know this is the Monterey Bay, but one of the things that sort of makes the point is the Santa Clara Valley. In the 50s, when they had all the suburban development and into the 60s, they had major subsidence suddenly their water tables dropped hundreds of feet. They were really not sustainable. And what they did is they built the reservoirs, Lexington, the others over by Morgan Hill. They let the water flow to percolation ponds. They recharged the aquifer, and they got to a complete sustainable rotating system, with one exception. It only provides 45% of the water that Silicon Valley needs. So they, enter, they import 55% from either Hetch Hetchy or the Delta. And uh, yet they at least got to being sustainable with what they have before they went there. Now they're opening recycling plants and other things to try to diversify their portfolio. And the conservation here on the Monterey Peninsula has been incredible since the state water order in the mid 19 90s in Santa Cruz at one point uh, in the state restrictions a year and a half ago uh, was the lowest uh, per capita of a municipal water district in the state because of what they were saving. And, and since I'm speaking to a hometown crowd, one of the things that used to make me crazy is these people in the very hot Sierra foothills would say, um, you know, these water restrictions aren't adjusted for climate. We're much warmer here than those people on the coast. And yet they were using 200 to 300 uh, gallons per day per person in those places. And Santa Cruz's basis was 55 gallons per day. Don't tell me that's not adjusted for climate. And, and I made that argument in lots of statewide conventions. And as usual, too, because you can always get a laugh when you talk about Santa Cruz uh, uh, statewide. <clears throat> I pointed out that after your first violation in Santa Cruz, uh, you could work your violation off by going to water school. And uh, people in the other parts of the state love that. And, and that was when there was that uh, uh, over-the-top editorial cartoonist for the Santa Cruz paper who showed water school and that showed the water director standing there with whips and a rack and other things uh, uh, doing it. But it's exactly what you want. If somebody doesn't know how to conserve, you want to give them a chance to learn how to conserve and figure it out. And they did, and they institutionalized it, and that's one of the reasons they ended up having great conservation uh, uh, levels. Um, farmland. I, I, in the budget meltdown in 2009, the state stopped funding the Williamson Act. And so I have used cap and trade money, and we are now doing uh, farmland easements, ag land easements, and trying to work with local governments on planning to restore uh, farmland protection in California and try to prioritize those places that are most at risk, which is very important for the agriculture sector of, of the economy. And the problem was is when the economy was tanking, uh, then that was not a time anybody was building or developing. So it allowed a little bit of a pause on the pressure of ag land conversion. But now that the economy's come back, 
those challenges are right back where they were before the, uh, the economic uh, meltdown. Um, on the Delta, the governor has made a goal that we will do 30,000 acres of wetlands restoration, uh, at least have it started before he leaves. And we're already dedicating various projects because that's really important to fish cycles. It's resiliency in the face of climate change. A one foot sea level rise changes a 100 year flood event in the Delta to a 10 year flood event. So trying to have wetlands as a resiliency or a climate change thing, as well as helping the fish populations that we need uh, uh, on the coast. On the tree mortality, um, that is an incredible challenge because many, many of the dead trees are in remote places that, that are tough to manage or tough to get to. Overwhelming majority are on federal land where they are not budgeted in, in a good way. And we are trying to, with the state, we have the interface, the urban interface with forested lands, which is where the biggest fire risk is. And if you try to look at fire through the climate change prism, uh, the Rim Fire in 2013 was uh, the, the carbon emissions from that fire were equal to the carbon emissions of 2.3 million cars in California in a year. So if we are truly talking about lowering our carbon footprint, it really means we have to do fire prevention wherever there's uh, interfaces with the urban footprint. And CAL FIRE has this policy that is little heralded that they overcommit resources right at the beginning of uh, a fire so that they can try to knock it down before it gets big. And, and I got here when Jeanette was still on the panel uh, before lunch, and she had been trying to get Mark Stone and I out to see uh, some of the Big Sur land trust lands. And we went in on this Friday morning, and you know we were in four-wheel drive uh, uh, vehicles, and they would occasionally say, brace for a creek, and we would go in and, and do this. And then when we're in the interior, here come all these cow fire helicopters and we're a couple of miles away from the start of the fire in Garapata Park when it was starting. So the minute I got out to cell phone reception, I was on the phone with the Cal Fire Chief and they had committed all these resources and they were trying to hold it at 70 acres and they were trying to hold it at 200 acres and then you see what happens when, when that doesn't work. And there are occasional fires like the Lake County fires where that was at something, one of the Lake County fires was at something like 1,500 acres before you could get a fire truck out to it because it was just moving so fast in the winds and with the tinderbox. So that's public safety, it's climate change, it's all these things. We're trying to deal with fuels preparation near urban areas. We're trying to enforce the fire code with people so they have defensible space, which given Carmel Highlands and some of the places people there get completely uh, uh, at this point. But that is a, a climate change issue as well. And we have had of the 10 worst fires in California history, something like seven or eight of them have been in the last decade. So it is really uh, moving in this direction and we have uh, to be ready. And the economic loss and dislocation, just ask anybody that's a business in Big Sur, is something you want to prevent uh, uh, by trying to deal with that. On sea level rise, we are really working with the local governments. Uh, we have funded the Coastal Commission's update on local coastal plans so that they can work with local governments to try to think about that they're going to do it. And as a former mayor, if you have a gravity flow a sewer system or water system that's attuned to the current sea level and you're making an investment that might be for 30 or 50 or 70 years, you have to think about this because it is going to be different and it is going to change. And so it is something that you really have to, if you're a municipal official, think about if you're going to make an investment that is a solid one going forward because that basic infrastructure is what allows business and economy and, and people to go. And, uh, and one maybe uh, last thing on, on that list, um, y which is rivers were mentioned in that. And, and uh, my predecessor in the assembly, Fred Keeley, worked with the then speaker 
on parks bond measures that were passed in the late 1990s. And traditionally, <clears throat> park bond measures acquired lots of property in rural areas. <clears throat> they, <clears throat> excuse me, they really didn't focus on cities. And in those measures, for the first time, they said, we're going to do 50% for urban areas, 50% for more rural areas. And when you were trying to put parks or recreational facilities in city areas, it really meant there were two prime places, along rivers and in power line corridors, amazingly. And so across California, we've been funding things to improve rivers. Yes, with integrated regional watershed management funds, uh, water quality and wetlands, but it's really walkways, lighting, uh, the different kinds of things to integrate rivers into cities. And on uh, this area in the Monterey Bay region, you heard about the San Lorenzo and what's going on there, and, and we have done some grants over time for the bridge and some of the lighting and some of the other things. The Carmel River is the textbook case. When I arrived, I had this weird thing where the governor and I shook hands on this job in the, in the transition, but I wasn't supposed to tell anybody. So for three weeks, I was trying to inform myself without being able to tell anybody why I was informing myself. And so I logged on to every web page that was related in the universe and was stunned to find on the face of the resources agency web page a map of the Carmel River watershed because with the dam going down and the causeway on the bridge at the mouth and the restoration of the lagoon and the donation of the Eastwood land and other Big Sur land trust activities, uh, it was going to be a whole scale change to the watershed and ecosystem of the Carmel River and the resources agency wanted to show other people in the state how with all those things together, uh, that was a textbook case of how to start to approach that and do that. And so we're, that's happening, the Carmel River, the San Lorenzo, at the Pajaro, there's flood issues and the state's prepared to invest money in, in whatever flood control can be agreed upon there. And there are all these issues that exist to allow cities to be safe from floods, to allow recreation, to allow tourists to come, to do all the kinds of things that are sort of pieces uh, uh, of the economy. So I think overall, it's, we know we need healthy and stable farms and we're trying to figure out how to get there. We have to have a resilient coast in the face of sea level rise. We have to actually have a park system that is funded uh, because there are economic studies about the amount of money that anybody that comes to a state park spends in an adjoining community and this place only rivals, I think, uh, Mendocino and Humboldt County and the number of state parks that there are in the region and uh, we had an unfortunate meltdown in the state park system when I'd been there about a year and a half but it gave us the opportunity I appointed a commission uh, we looked at how to try to change the park system top to bottom we didn't account for individual parks you had to be badged law enforcement to be in regional leadership other people couldn't promote uh, Google Trekker has uh, mapped many of the trails, and they're available online. At most state parks, you could not pay unless it was in cash. It had not moved into the digital age. We now can pay digitally at 110 state parks and are on our way to 180. We account by individual parks now. But most significantly, last year, the legislature, in a partnership with us, formally legalized partnership arrangements. So if there's Friends of Santa Cruz State Parks or the Point Lobos Foundation or somebody that wants to work in parks management with the state, raise money, co-manage, do other things, we now have a legal and administrative framework to do that. And we are, I've been negotiating with the federal government because in the national monuments on the coast, whether it's Fort Ord, uh, Coast Dairies as BLM land, whether or not it's a national monument, uh, Stornetta in Mendocino, uh, Piedras Blancas in San Luis Obispo County, they adjoin a major state park, whether it's Big Basin or the beaches in Santa Cruz, Manchester, and there, uh, Fort Ord Dunes here, 
Hearst Castle next to Piedras Blancas, and we're looking at how to jointly manage to, to be more efficient, to have one radio system, where one side does the law enforcement, or one side does the trash pickup, or something so that we're not spending extra to maintain two facilities that are right next to each other, and that allows us to have more that, that we can uh, spend. So all these things fit totally into uh, the economic vision of the region, that you have enough water, uh, that you have people coming because it's a place they want to come, that we're prepared for a change in climate. And these are daunting challenges. Uh, he, he, somebody was telling me about the morning presentation uh, of just focus on one thing and be successful. I, I would love to do that. <laughs> I would just love to do that. But, um, and as I'm fond of saying, if it's working really well, it never gets to my desk. Uh, uh, I'm sitting there mediating between people or trying to solve problems or trying to figure out how to get enough money to do what we need to do. But we, we are in a golden time in California because we actually are practically looking at these things, trying to problem solve them based on the facts and science and try to have them a better for a future generation. So uh, that's why we just really want to work in partnership with a group like this that focuses energy and people from different sectors on solving those kind of problems. And that's why I'm uh, really happy to be here today. And I know we still have some time for questions, so I'd be happy to take, uh, it, well, I'll, I'll wait and see what the questions are, but I think I'd be happy uh, to take whatever questions you have. <clears throat> Somebody want to risk a question? Here and here, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the million dollar question was uh, how might California be preparing for what might be happening at the federal level after January 20th? And we have certain things we're doing. To be honest, we're trying to see if there's anything we need to make sure is done before January 20th. But, um, but additionally, it's all speculation at this point, and we work arm in arm with the federal government. As a digression for a moment, before Election Day, not understanding the significance of this comment, uh, I frequently said that in my adult life it never occurred to me that the state government and the federal government might not align very often. And, you, you know, because if, if you come, uh, I happen to be a registered Democrat, and if you look at the amount of time uh, that a Democrat has been governor and a Democrat has been president since I graduated from college over 40 years ago, it's 10 years, and six of those 10 years have been the last six years. And, and so it's been marvelous to be able to try to work together on water, work together on fish. We're issuing a desert renewables plan uh, to preserve certain areas for habitat permanently and then to put wind and solar in the prime areas uh, in the desert that it can be. Uh, we've done all these things together and now we just don't know for sure where it's going. And, and there's talk of moving on the Endangered Species Act and if there was talk of moving on the Endangered Species Act, how it affects water, it would not repeal the state Endangered Species Act. So it might mean the state has to enforce endangered species because there might be limited federal uh, protections. We're not necessarily staffed to do that. It might mean they get a little more water for the feds and a little less for the state. And so we're trying to game all these situations and figure out what the best way is to do it. But this is very early, and we haven't even seen who the appointments are going to be in the resources area. They've been focusing on financing and national security. So I am anxiously waiting to see who uh, is appointed Secretary of the Interior, and I'm really relieved that, that Sarah Palin, who was mentioned for Interior, might be going to veterans and be out of my uh, uh, way. There was a question over here. <clears throat> 
Yeah, uh, <coughs> Josh, I'm Josh Metz with the Fort Ord Reeves Authority. And uh, the question is, just uh, going forward, if you would mind expanding a little more on, on how the state's natural resources can provide a boon you for economic your... development? Well, maybe I didn't tie it to The question was, uh, how can state natural resources be a boon for economic development? And I think they're really an incredible part of the economy. So the question is, is how do we maximize whatever we can with regard to resources with the economy? And if it's state parks and the visitor serving economy, or if it's making sure there's a healthy fishery so the fishing industry can do it, or make sure there's adequate ag land and it's not under urban pressure to move out of production, make sure there's an adequate ag industry, or to make sure there's a sustainable supply of water for any economic sector uh, going forward. It might seem intangible, but those are very real, and it's trying to figure out how to do each one of those in a way that allows people to make the local decisions because they know that table has been set in the right way. There's one right here. Oh, okay. There's. I'm Mark Masidi Miller. I have a, a question. I heard earlier today that health dollars are sort of I'm sorry, which dollars? I couldn't hear. Health care related dollars can be used to develop housing if we think about housing first for the uh, homeless population in our community. Is there environmental dollars that are similarly available to s help solve our transportation problem in light of the dwindling sort of gas tax resource uh, for, to reduce vehicle miles traveled, reduce greenhouse gas emissions? Is, is there any thinking along those lines? There is some thinking along those lines, and, and one of the things is, is that we are the only state of the 50 states to have a cap-and-trade program right now. We, we do it in conjunction, amazingly, with the province of Quebec and Canada, and it looks like Ontario and Canada is going to come in. And for the uninitiated, uh, cap-and-trade is basically where you have people that have excessive emissions, and if you're an advocate, you call them polluters. But if there are people that have excessive emissions, they can cap them at a certain level and make a payment in lieu to buy lower emissions from another program so that overall emissions are lowering and they're buying their way into to lowering. And so we have this program, and it's had a couple of billion dollars thus far. And there, I sit on this a group of cabinet secretaries called the Strategic Growth Council, and it has had a grant program for sustainable communities that is really designed to deal with transportation and to some extent affordable housing, but transportation is its priority in a way that it is greener and lowers greenhouse gas emissions so that you might have housing near where uh, transportation is. You do things that lower vehicle miles traveled and it allows sort of funds for investment and there have been I think two grant rounds thus far, and there might be another one coming up. And we have been really working at sort of a higher level about who's eligible and to make sure that people really have access to this, that it's not just the big cities that have capacity or big planning departments or whatever. You can find out more by logging on to the Strategic Growth Council and I just don't know what the name of the web page is, but I'm sure if you Google it, it will get there. There'll be regulations and a grant uh, process that's there. But the thing about it is, is for example, on the ag land side, and we were trying to do this in some of the others, um, if somebody wants to apply, we were looking at a very simple letter of qualification so that we could find out if it competes so that they wouldn't have to have all this capacity just to get in the door. And then if we find out they have a competitive thing, we would invite an application and work with them so it wouldn't screen out disadvantaged communities or people that might not have the, the same capacity to apply. So, uh, and if worse comes to worse, if none of that makes any sense, just get in touch with my office and I will link you up with that. There's one there. Way, Mark. Uh, my name is Kirsten Liskey with Ecology Action, and my question was about the cap and trade program. Since the spring auction and fall auction netted only about 5% 
of the proceeds that were anticipated. A lot of these programs, including the Green Business Program, which was on deck to get some funding this year, are not being funded, including projects like High Speed Rail. What's the state's thinking on what's going on with the program? Do they think the auction sales will rebound? Um, and what's going to happen to all this important funding for environmental programs? Well, there was an auction sale, and now I'm not going to get it right, in the last 10 days and that auction rebounded. So it means that there's going to be back to uh, some level of funding that was in the previous auctions. And it still means that it might not be at the full level, and there are certain ones that are core priorities and certain ones that others. And the heartbreaking one for me is that uh, we lost the wetlands restoration one in this last round, and we had gotten 25 million out the door in the previous one, and we were looking at 75 million. And we are hoping that that comes back given the rebound. But it's up to the legislature and the governor with the money available to negotiate the priorities. So that's what will happen next, but it looks like. And supposedly, when Ontario comes in and there's a little more of a critical mass, uh, there's thinking that it, it, it might help the sales do well as well. Anything else? Yes. Hi, my name is Betsy Wilson. I'm with MidPen Housing. Um, and I have a question about cap and trade for you since it was brought up. Um, multiple applications under the Affordable Housing and Sustainable Communities program have been submitted from this region over the past two rounds, and none of them have been funded. Um, and we've been a little stymied at how to become sort of relevant in these programs because they're very urban centric. Um, so I'd be interested in your thoughts on that and also just hoping to put a bug in your ear about it and maybe we can change things going forward. Thank you. Just for the record, the bug is in my ear. Uh, um, and I have behind the scenes had those conversations for exactly that. And uh, one of the, the legislature added two public members to the Strategic Growth Council, and one of them is a former Central Coast uh, resident, Manuel Pastor, who used to be at UC Santa Cruz, who's now at uh, USC. And he uh, and I engaged in this colloquy at the last meeting about how to make sure there was equity uh, without having absolute quotas because we have this legal nexus that you have to prove that it's lowering the emissions and, and you can never get away from that. So the question is, is how can you get some measure of equity and not get away from what the legal nexus is that sort of makes the program work? And so in the, my experience has been, and y you know, it's always very funny because whenever people come to brief me, uh, even though they're not supposed to, the first thing they say is, is, here's what got funded or didn't get funded on the Central Coast. And I am always worried about being pigeonholed uh, uh, as not being a statewide uh, uh, person and not being fair to everybody in the state. But I have asked that question, and there is a system on it, – it, it there's an interesting system for de determining uh, – economic equity that's in different iterations. It's called Cal and Viro screen. And I'm not going to get it exactly right, but the first one was by census code, and the second one was by zip code. And they are still trying to refine it. And so they came to my conference room to do a live demonstration of it to me. And I couldn't help myself. So I said, put up the 95060 zip code. Now tell me how Davenport fits in this. And Davenport, which to me is a classic disadvantaged community, gets subsumed in the 95060 zip code in a way that they said there are other factors that will move it up. And I said, well, you better demonstrate them to me. Um, and so there are some of us that are asking those questions, and we would like to work to make sure that there there is equity over time. But it is a legitimate thing that that a lot of times you can demonstrate uh, greater changes when you're dealing with urban densities in dense areas as opposed to some of the other ones in the, around the state that don't have the same density. And it is a challenge. We might, and it is worth writing a letter and expressing your concern and getting it into the mix when the regulations are done. Because one of the banes of my existence as an elected official would be when people think, oh, he agrees with us, we don't have to write him. 
So my mail would be running 10 to 1 against some position I had that I knew the district had because everybody thought I was just going to do it because I was in the right place. So don't succumb to that. Make sure that you write and express that in a good way and it moves into the mix. Ah, the shine retiring Susan Brucci. <laughs> As we move together towards really thinking about regionalism here, I've just wondered if you might give us some advice about some opportunities we might not be thinking about and if there's anything we need to be careful of. That's a really, really good question. And I think in some ways it's always a thing about uh, opportunities for sort of in water, it's called conjunctive use, and it, it, it for example, in the uh, in the Santa Cruz part, when you have the Soquel Creek Water District that's 100% on wells, and you have the Santa Cruz City System that's 98% surface water, uh, droughts hit differently, and if you were to do one joint water supply project, it could back up Santa Cruz in the dry times when the surface water isn't there. And in the wet times, it could help SoCal Creek recharge. And it is a way that it's not doing the massive development that some people are worried about. It's being more efficient given the lay of the systems. And it's looking at those kinds of opportunities around the Monterey Bay and seeing where they are and seeing how you could do them. Am I getting a signal? A little bit. OK. Yes. <laughs> I don't really want to give John Laird a signal, but. Okay. Um, we well, do want to thank you. Let's yeah. thank John.